Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. Today I'm in Kouris in Fife. Now thousands flock here each year to see film locations used for the fictional hero Jamie Fraser in Outlander, but they miss the real hero. In my Scotland History Tour videos, I've told stories about Robert the Bruce, John Logie Baird, Andrew Carnegie, scientists, inventors, politicians, war heroes, troublemakers, independence fighters, nobility, men who became fabulously rich and men unjustly imprisoned. Today, I'm going to tell you about a single guy who was all these things and more. There are some people live more lifetimes in one existence than a nation experiences in a century. And this guy is one of them. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then hit the subscribe button at the bottom right for more information, links, books, how to buy me a coffee or become a member. All that is in the description below. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. This is Thomas Cochrane. He's a boy's own hero who was continually mired in controversy. A nobleman who upset the nobility. A lord who wanted to enlarge the right to vote. A fraudster who was jailed but then knighted by Queen Victoria. And a Latin American freedom fighter. Now that's a lot to get through before your porridge. The reason that Curis has been used as a film set in period adventures is that its exteriors have been largely unchanged since the 17th century, so that Curis today looks a bit like it would have when Thomas Cochrane grew up. Now, I said he was a hero. I'll tell you how much of a hero he was. He joined the Royal Navy when he was five years old. It was actually his uncle that enrolled him at that age, and it was a ploy so that by 1793, when he joined for real at 17, which is actually a bit late, he had enough years service to do so as a midshipman. I've no idea. But he was diligent, curious, industrious and brave. And he learned his trade quickly as Britain fought revolutionary then Napoleonic France. In 1800, Lord Nelson had captured some French ships and Cochrane was given the responsibility of taking one back to base, which he managed to do through a storm-ridden, enemy-infested Mediterranean. And as a reward, he was made Commodore and given charge of a small 14-gun ship firing four-pounders. Now that means that there were seven guns either side and each gun could fire Four of these. Now you might be thinking that Lurpak wasn't invented until 1901, but that's how far ahead his time Thomas Cochrane was. Not only was the firepower of this new ship puny, but with only five feet headroom, the ship was too small for him to stand upright below deck. <laughs> I think your naval talent was weighed against that court-martial for insubordination when they gave you that ship. Maybe that was the Navy's way of telling you to keep your mouth shut. What do you think? Anyway, I'm sure I'm not the first person to tell you it's not the size of your frigate that matters. And Thomas Cochrane certainly knew how to use his to make an impact. This young naval officer in this tiny little ship sunk, grounded or captured 53 enemy ships in 13 months. That's one a week. That's mental. Did you ever see the film Master and Commander where Russell Crowe's character was being chased by a bigger ship and they had no chance, right? So as night fell, they floated a lamp in a barrel, killed all the lamps in the ship and then escaped as the enemy followed the light of the empty drifting barrel. That was Thomas Cochrane. In fact, all your Jack Aubrey and Horatio Hornblower novels are based on Thomas Cochrane. There was one time that this little 14-gun, 50-crew boat took on a 32-gun, 300-crew Spanish monster. It's like a bloke in a bike squaring up to a Bradley tank. It doesn't matter how hard you throw those packs of butter, that's a fight you can't win. How would you feel if you were the captain of the big ship, somebody throws butter and you end up with egg in your face? That'd take the biscuit. So, what Cochrane did was to sail his tiny ship, it was called the Speedy, towards the big warship, but flying an American flag. When he got in close, he suddenly unfurled the British flag. By that time, because the ship was so small, the big Spanish gunports were too high to aim at the Speedy's deck and hull, and they ended up just firing into the sails. So everyone in the Speedy was safe, apart from one really tall guy that got his head blown off, right? But he wouldn't be so smart standing in front of folk at the rugby, new, will he? Hey. Anyway, 
The gunners on the Speedy threw everything at the hull of the big ship. Butter, sugar, eggs, milk. The whole side of the big ship was scone. One four pounder was like an annoying fly, but lots of them continually was like a swarm of midges and the big ship was like a lowlander in a wooded loch in July. So the Spanish gathered together on deck to jump across and board the Speedy. But when they did that, Cochrane sailed just out of reach and started to blast the boarding party on the deck. Now the Speedy was far enough away for the big Spanish guns to hit it, so the Spanish ran back to their firing stations. Whilst they did this, the Speedy came back in close again and started pounding. Damn it! The Spanish came back on deck to board and the Speedy pulled away. Every time the Spanish went to the guns, the Speedies came in close and pounded. When they went to board, Speedy moved away and pounded the boarding party. Ya fannies! Eventually, the Speedy had no sails left because that's all the Spanish were hitting. So at this point, Cochrane dropped off a boarding party at the bow of the Spanish ship. As the Spanish went to meet them, the Speedy slipped back and dropped another boarding party at the rear. Hand-to-hand -hand combat followed that and the British pulled down the Spanish colours. And that's how a 50-man little sloop captured a 300-man Spanish warship. Look, I don't have time to list, let alone describe the extraordinary feats that Cochrane carried out in this pushbike of the seas, but it was incredible, astounding, unprecedented, unbelievable. I'll leave a link to books below. Now remember that when you took a foreign ship, the captain got a big chunk of the value. So Cochrane was becoming a very rich man. He was also becoming a wanted man. It took a squadron of three huge French gunships sent to hunt and capture him and his tiny little boat. When he was captured, some daft French officer released him in exchange for another French captain and Napoleon went mental and court-martialed the French officer for being a plonker in the line of duty. Cochrane got a bigger ship and with it he did all sorts of daring stuff. They landed on dry land and captured a French fort. They sneaked into a French signal station, copied the codes and left the originals so that the Royal Navy knew exactly what the French were up to. As I said, I don't have time for the whole list. Then he stood for Parliament and became an MP. Now, in spite of being from a noble family, he was radical and supported reform and an increase in voting rights. Now, that rubbed a bunch of lords and admirals up the wrong way. But he was asked to come back out of semi-retirement as an MP to sink the French Atlantic fleet hiding in the Bay of Biscay. Now, the only reason he wasn't completely successful in this was that the admiral under whom he worked was a vacillating chicken. Oh no, he slagged off an admiral now and there's a national incident. Now, the whole of the establishment hates him. He made himself a target for revenge, and soon there was an opportunity. When, in February 1814, a rumour broke out that Napoleon was dead and had been killed by some Russian Cossacks, the stock market rocketed at the thought that the war was ending. Half a dozen blokes made a killing on a particular government stock. Now, you and I know that the Battle of Waterloo wasn't until 1815 and that Napoleon died on a remote island in the Atlantic in 1821, so it looked like a fraudulent conspiracy. So when Cochrane sold, in today's terms, around £10 million of the stock that he'd only recently bought, it looked suspicious. Now, Cochrane had actually given his agent a standing instruction that if the stock went up by 1%, he was to sell. So he actually missed most of the big gains. But the fact that he was neither a big gainer or actively involved in the transaction didn't help him. He'd upset enough people in the Tory establishment that he was caught up in the affair, convicted of fraud, stripped of his knighthood, sacked from the Navy, thrown out of Parliament and sentenced to a year in jail, a thousand pound fight and an hour in the pillory. Now, they relented in the pillory but on the grounds that he was so popular the scene might be more trouble than it is worth. Did he escape from jail? <laughs> of course he did! But rather than run away, he went straight back to Parliament to state his innocence. And he put him back in jail again. 
If you've been wrongly convicted of fraud, deselected as an MP, oh, did I mention that when the by-election for a seat was held a month later, he was re-elected unopposed? Anyway, you're thrown out of the Navy, but you're still independently wealthy with a title to inherit. What would you do? That's right, you'd become a Latin American freedom fighter. I know I would. The detail I'll have to wait for another video, but he almost single-handedly won independence for Chile from the Spanish. Well done, sir. Oh, could you do that with Peru as well? Nay bother. Lord Cochrane, we've got Brazil holding on line two. I'll be there in a minute. Now, it goes without saying that all the way along he rubbed important people up the wrong way, but he did get things done. In Brazil, he took control of the Brazilian Navy, drove the Portuguese out and harried the retreating ships all the way across the Atlantic. He then went back to two remaining Portuguese strongholds and bluffed the garrisons into surrender. The next year, he put down a rebellion. Then he got in an argument with authorities over the rewards and the prize money he was due and he ended up compensating himself from the public funds in São Luís de Mourinho. He looted the ships in the harbour, stole one of them and headed back to Europe. Brazilians must hate him. Actually, they still celebrate him. After setting up the fledgling Greek Navy to fight for independence against the Ottoman Empire, he came back to Britain, where Queen Victoria pardoned them for the whole fraud thing and they asked them to become an admiral. But he said no. Not until you give me my knighthood back. Oh, arise, Admiral Sir Thomas Cochrane. Oh, did I forget to mention that he registered several patents, invented improvements to gas lighting, convoy lanterns, tubular boilers, steam turbines and screw propellers for ships. Oh, sorry, how could I have forgotten? I know, it was because I was too busy thinking about his literary career and the two best-selling biographies that he published. Lord Nelson, the second best seaman in the British Navy, might have a column in London, but our guy has a bust in Curis. Oh, and a monument in Santiago, Chile. And Valparaiso, Chile. Nova Scotia, Canada. He's also remembered in Peru, Brazil and Greece. And I tell you what, they won't forget him in France or Spain in a hurry either. The Chilean Navy lay a wreath as rest in place in the nave of Westminster Abbey in May each year. Working as a tour guide, Brazilians have asked me to bring them here to Curis so that they can see this bust. Yet how many Scottish people even know his name? If you have any patriotism in your soul, then you'll tell the world by sharing this video with everyone that you know. And when you've done that, you need to click the link at the end for a playlist on other under-recognised men and women in Scotland's past. I'll leave you to do that, shall I? I'll see you in those videos. I mean, a dog is going to be a lamb of my life. Cheerio and Rasta.